<clears throat> so we're going to look at a much higher rated um, opponent now, a two five four eight, and again um, in the Nimzo Indian. So Lenderman, Alex Lenderman, who I guess with that rating must be a grandmaster. I believe Lenderman is a grandmaster. Uh, so with the white pieces. So d4. So Adams again plays knight f6. So c4, e6. But now white is willing to give black a bit more fun in this game. Um, in the opening by playing knight c3. So the full concept of the Nimzo engine, the double pawn strategy, the idea of um, putting pressure on e4, maybe blockading these pawns, that might be more relevant to this game. So bishop b4. After knight f3, b6. So again, remember, we've got two options for this bishop to attack. a6 or c4. Bishop g5. Bishop's kicked, trying to get rid of this annoying pin. And in fact now, this looks as though this could have some downsides for weaknesses later, breaking the pin. Uh, but this, this is kind of theoretical, knight e4. So pressure on c3. Bishop b7, supporting the knight. And now the double pawns are inflicted on white. Adams plays bishop takes c3. And now takes away e5 from, from white. He plays d6. Okay. It's all theoretical. Bishop d3, f5. And I think even this pawn set now, it's thematic to try and get the bishops working. This move d5. White really, sorry, black really doesn't want to take this pawn, you know, because then maybe c4 later is going to be quite destructive. Or you know the knight coming to d4 would hit f5, so this diagonal is going to be crumbling. So actually, instead against d5, one downside potentially is this c5 square. Adams just perches a knight potentially on c5. He plays um, knight a6 to get to c5 quickly, and on c5 it's actually also protecting e6. Both sides now castle. Now the knight on e4 is kicked and white doesn't mind losing the bishop pair. Maybe he's thinking, you know, there could be some dynamic compensation later if maybe a rook can come to h1 later. So takes queen f6. So maybe this move, it's supporting f5. So that means e5 might be on the cards just to kick away this powerfully centralized knight. So white doesn't want e5, maybe he plays d takes e6, and he loses his other bishop. And now after c5, Adams is offering what looks to be uh, a weakness uh, to attack d6. But have we seen, as we've seen in many games, it's not really that weak. Here, um, black doesn't even have to regain the e6 pawn that quickly. So he doesn't have to play queen e6, he can just calmly defend d6 now with rook a d8. So knight c7 defending e6 and coming into d5. Is this going to be a problem for Adams? He chases the knight actively with to d5 to try and maybe win the e6 pawn. There's no other choice it seems which is reasonable for white. So so giving up e6. So this knight seems to be quite good against the bishop. White can reinforce d5 and increase pressure on the d file. Rook a b1. So a little bit of pressure. Maybe, you know, white's intending soon a4, a5. Because that's his one of his trump cards is this b-file pressure. The other, you know, if, if undoubling the pawns, that seems to be unattractive. But um, for black, you know, e3 is a target on that semi-open e-file. So the king is stepping in to defend e3. 
Now queen f7. Queen f7 vacates e6. So maybe rook e6, rook e8, just double on e6 like that. And then at the right time take. The queen's still on the diagonal. So rook e3 might be on the cards later. Rook f e1. In fact, rook e5 is chosen. After e4, maybe a different plan altogether now. Forget about doubling rooks. Black now, Adams, just plays seemingly passive move. Bishop c8. So what does bishop c8 do? Well, potentially, I think after f e, rook e4, there'll be bishop f5 skewering the rook to the queen. So I think f takes e4 has a bit more venom now in some of these variations of this move. White plays e takes f5 and bishop takes f5. Looks a bit nasty. In fact, why did white play this? You might be asking. <laughs> so queen f1. White's offered the exchange. For what? The exchange down now, but this knight's pretty pretty useful. It's pretty big knight on d5. The king seems to be solid for the moment. So how can this rook fight this knight? So very interesting position here now at move 29. So Adams first actually offers the exchange of queens to simplify it further. White really can't concede this diagonal. He actually takes the queens off. And plays king e3. So is this king going to be coming to e4? e5 is going to be a problem. Where is this brook going to make inroads? Maybe, you know, Adams is thinking like this. Or the f file could be useful potentially. He plays actually g4. Okay. So that would be treble pawns. Wouldn't be too, too useful for white to have treble pawns. So king e4. King g6. Now if takes here, then takes, and then rook takes f3. So the king's tied down to defend f3. Um, so check. Now rook g8. So with the threat of maybe taking a rook takes g3. So he takes. So the king defends um, g3, but now the, the black king can step in. That's a major concession, king f5. And here Lenderman resigns actually. There's e4 on the cards. It's quite nasty. Now it looks like it's pretty nasty because if, if the king's forced back, well the rook can also come to, to win a2 if needed as well. So this looks like a, a lost position now. Um, so that was an interesting Nimza engine game as well. Well true Nimza engine, none of this um, Queen's engine business. So let's have a look at this game. So this is from the World Open in round three. Maybe it's not as aesthetically pleasing as the other game but sort of interesting if you're going to play the Nims of Indians check these games out so bishop b7 and double pawns are inflicted on white white tries to create dynamism with d5 but it seems black has adequate resources with a knight coming to c5 here just in time uh, you know threatening the bishop as well as defending um, e6 Okay, so white gives up both bishops basically now with this next sequence. First the dark square bishop, and now we see the light square bishop going. So we're getting a simplified scenario of this bishop versus that knight. And it gets kind of intriguing after white's exchange sack coming up very shortly. So rook ab1, rook d8. Both both sides were targeting their semi-open fold target pawns, you know, b6 and e3 here. So b6 for white and e3 for black. So queen f7. So keeps the options open, like rookie 5 in particular, it actually looks quite kind of strong as well. 
for all three to gang up on d5 if needed. So that seems better than rook e6 actually now in retrospect. So threatening to win a pawn in fact. So what, what could white have done here? The knight's stuck. Can't go back. Can't go back here. Whoops. So e4 was, was kind of um, a necessary concession. With e4 of course, e, you know, f takes e4 is, is more dangerous, especially if there's a bishop here to come to f5. So this looks as though white's crumbling actually because the king is not ideally placed to be on f2 here. So what could white have done here? It's it's a big problem now because of this f takes and bishop f5. So he comes up with this exchange sacrifice idea. Maybe um, this smacks of desperation to sack the exchange. But for a while it did look intuitively that knight on d5 did look kind of strong. But it's clearly not enough it seems. Uh, because Adams is quite resourceful in the f file now with this g4. So he keeps tying down that, that king otherwise the knight would really you know be a monster if more pawns are collected. So knight c6. And now it's it's just simply a case of being the exchange down. So here white resigned. Uh, so some subtle little positional manoeuvring there, causing you know tactical exposure, I think. That bishop c8 in particular, basically causing white to sack the exchange, and then some further, you know, clever dynamic moves from black, make sure that the exchange up is relevant for Adams. Okay, uh, let's go on and check another game. I hope you guys got something uh, from that second game. Okay, so I'll be back in a minute with one another game. Okay. Okay, Adams is white here. Okay, and he's up against Mikhail Kekel Kekelizis. I don't know how to pronounce that. Two, four, six, three. So e4. Let's flip the board. Okay, c5 Sicilian defense. Knight f3. Main line Sicilian. Well, with d4 so we have a6 now Adams chooses uh, bishop d3 here actually quite interesting so with this there's a kind of signal that maybe you know casting king side is on the cards not queen side queen b6 now instead of retreating the knight back actually Adams chooses c3 And after knight c6, white makes a gambit of it in this position. He just castles. He makes a gambit out of it, allowing black to win a pawn. So where's the compensation? This is a sharper position, though. There's, there's, there's going to be compensation here. You know, black has not developed any pieces, so it's quite good fun. Uh, there's only two pawn moves. This queen, has it just taken a poison pawn? That's what we're about to see. So bishop e3 and another poison pawn, but queen takes b2, the classic poison pawn is taken. So there's going to be lots of tempo gaining moves potentially on the queen now. Poor queen. And look at also the c file, you know, potentially that's that's a liability. So knight d2. So potentially there's like things like knight c4. D5 stops knight c4. Adams now takes, is opening up the e file. And now his next move, rook e1, immediately threatens bishop d4 check to win the queen. So has black been a bit greedy from this opening? He seems to have accepted a kind of positional gambit from Adams. He makes a concession now. He's, he plays bishop e6. After rook b1, you know, white's getting a rook potentially quite dangerously to the seventh rank. 
but it's not taken here. Uh, the bishop is now attacked. So bishop f5, nice move, because if bishop takes f5, then check would win the queen again. Knight f6, a pawn is regained with rook takes b7, finally. Now black's scrambling to castle, and he can do this because the queen's actually supporting e7. So has he managed to get away with things? Adams takes a bishop d4, shows there's some dark square pressure to contend with, also pressure on e6. Black's willing to give up e6 though, just to castle. Okay, gives up e6. Queen d3. Is white actually a little bit vulnerable here? There seems to be a trade of bishops invited now. But the rooks on the 7th look pretty dangerous. So black is allowing rook takes g7. Is he going to try and hijack this g file with rook g8 soon? Is that the intention? Queen b1. Okay. So what is going on here? If queen takes d2, black gets mated, rook takes, because the queen is supporting the rooks now for rook takes h7. So that's defended with queen h4. But now knight f3 hitting the queen. And now another nice move, putting more pressure on h7, knight g5. I think here is crunch time already. It seems black's... Um, gone downhill since the opening it was on the receiving end of a lot of pressure and in this position he's also a pawn down <laughs> so this is pretty nasty stuff um, but has he got salvation he sacrifices the queen for two rooks or is it no knight e6 check it's rook and knight versus queen scenario but white has got an extra pawn as well Maybe two extra pawns coming up. Two extra pawns. Check. Okay, I think white's materially better. And he's got the outside past a pawn now. Queen b2. So immediately threatening um, queen b4 check. Prepares knight c5. But it just protects the rook anyway. Black really can't set up a fortress here. I think the rest... Is, is very difficult for black to defend. White makes some air for his king. Check. And now the pass pawn is ready to be pushed. Check. F3. Okay, another pass pawn on the horizon with g4. Two pass pawns, potentially. Check. 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 Three pass pawns if this pawn can be removed which it is. Obviously black's in a hopeless position, but can he do something with this d pawn? Not really that likely with queen g6 blockading the advance and, and preparing this pawn. So here black actually resigned. So that seemed to be a nice intuitive gambit from white, just maybe just an early, what can we say, an early positional sacrifice in a very sharp position where black hadn't developed many pieces. So let's have a look at that again. So Sicilian defense with an unusual looking bishop d3. And white, you know, playing not knight b3 but c3, I think it's quite interesting that this gambit was already in mind. To play c3, not minding, you know, knight c6 and just sacrifice a pawn, I think it's very, very interesting. I don't know what you guys think of c3 because ordinarily you wouldn't think of c3 because you know you're blocking you know maybe the knight wanted to go to c3 but to have this gambit in mind is is very interesting I think so knight c6 just offering a gambit pawn but white's getting loads of pressure really intuitively we can see white's getting loads of pressure but it's not nice to see this stuff being played on the longer time limits so two pawns given. Big initiative for black. Uh, sorry, for white, with black having to defend like mad now. 
So knight d2, you know, immediate threats like knight c4, come, maybe coming to b6, then rook c1. That poor c8 bishop could be a victim very, very soon. So black felt the need to take away c4. White took, he's opening up the e file, kind of menacing threats now. Knight bishop d4. So bishop e6. Okay, so rook b1. Um, Black maybe did well to play queen a3, so he's supporting his idea that he's going to play bishop e7 later, and, and the bishop supported on e7 by the queen. There's an onslaught basically though. Bishop f5. So if takes, there's bishop c5 check, winning the queen again. So this onslaught, Adams is getting one of his pawns back, only a pawn down, and soon he's going to get the other pawn back. Equal on pawns now. Um, so one question here. I think if the bishop had, had moved off f6, uh, then bishop um, takes f6, and then queen g4 is devastation on g7. If you know, if, if black has to take with, with, with g pawn, then queen g4 will be mating. So um, we have here a horrible scenario, though, with a huge pressure on h7 so immediate threat of mating again with rook takes h7 so Adams really forcefully got material now with forcing moves knight g5 and it's rook and knight versus queen uh, coming up so a very forceful sharp game here in contrast to the games with Adams as black in the Nimzo engine or Queen's engine this this uh, really uh, is very difficult for Black, and he's materially down anyway. Okay, I think there's time for one more game. Um, I hope you enjoyed that one and got something from it. Um, so maybe one of the points c3. You know, you might never have thought about c3 gamut. Your c pawn, in fact, and then your b pawn. Okay, so we'll take. Um, one more game. So Adams against Elvis, Jan Evels thinks Elvis thinks experienced um uh, I think Russian Grandmaster, so twenty five 80. Okay, so this is in the World Open round four. So e4 from white, Adams playing white. Sicilian again. Now knight c6, inviting maybe, you know, Sicilian Sveshnikov main lines, but um, Adams has got a pet system. Bishop b5, very annoying Rosalimo attack. So Rosalimo, another very famous um, US. Player this this system with he invented it with great effect or he popularized it rather with great effect. So after g6, white inflicts double pawns. So castles bishop g7. White's play seems to be quite straightforward. Uh, rook e1, just as always like playing the royal lopez or something. You know, this central control, maybe c3, d4 is going to come up as though the Roy Lopez is being played. So knight h6. Maybe, uh, you know, f5 or even f6 and knight f7 later is the idea. But white occupies the center. Black attacks it from the flanks. So the queen and bishop coordinating an attack on d4. Adams is not too worried. He just plays knight d2. Doesn't worry about black undoubling the pawns either actually here so cd cd because this bishop's not too effective in this position actually at the moment d6 now we see b3 so not only neutralizing b file pressure but potentially you know white wants an exchange of this one for this one to weaken the squares around the king here 
f6 now bishop b2 look at all of white's pieces they're all doing stuff they're all neat there's no bad piece in white's position so knight f7 rook c1 bit of pressure on the queen side a3 defending the a2 pawn now b4 as though c5 is being discouraged Knight c4, the knight could be real torture here if it goes to a5, because then c6 is going to be potentially victimized. So a5 is played. A little bit of a, a sacrifice, really. It's black sacrificing a pawn. Um, if knight takes a5, then there's rook takes a5. And if takes, then there's queen takes b2. So white has to play an ugly looking move. B takes a5, doubling his pawns. But it is an extra pawn, nevertheless. The knight is protecting, of course, b2 here. So a pawn up. Has black got counterplay? He plays bishop g4. Adam simply kicks the bishop, invites bishop f3. Now d5. Is this going to be a problem if the knight moves, then queen takes b2? It's not a problem at the moment because now white plays a4, a little bit of a tactical trick. If queen takes a f a4, then knight b6, it would fork rook and queen. So queen moves. And it's moved to a pinning line, actually, where the, the pawn's going to be pinned against the queen. So e d5, the pawn is pinned. So there's no threat. The bishop is now free to move. No threat because of the queen on the queen. And e7 is under fire now. So White's achieved a very comfortable position out of the opening from this Rosalimo system, it seems. Knight g5, though. Is this breaking the pin? Is black ready to, for d takes c4? Okay, now Adams actually calmly plays Queen E2 here. It's a bit of a shock, at least to me, because I was wondering here, why, why couldn't Black just take the knight here? Um, what do you guys think of this? I think the problem with taking the knight... Maybe just check. Is that the problem? If if the king moves, there's rook takes e7. But here, what what if e6? Do any of you guys spot a problem with uh, d takes c4 here? Or have we got this game wrong? Maybe. Um, Maybe a stronger move is bishop takes e7. So again, uh, if if the rook moves, well, there's queen c4. I don't know. It seems to be dangerous enough for, for black to avoid playing d takes c4. If, if there's anything obvious about this position, which I've missed, about d takes c4, um, please can you let me know? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to engine analyze that later. Um, okay. Unless any of you uh, spot something now. So black actually defended rook f e8. So there must be some tactical reason for this. h4 kicking the knight. Now rook b1 kicking the queen somewhere. The knight now moves freely to b6. Inviting exchange of queens. But look at the amount of pressure now. e7 on the fire. It doesn't matter about e a5 so much now because of e7. So e7 drops. So white, he's a solid outside a pawn up here. Bishop f8, offering the f6 pawn which is taken. So why did he do that? I think otherwise, well, rook b5 is on the cards, and then winning d5, for example, or just taking with the rook. So it's probably a desperate 
it's, it looks to be a very desperate position rather now so two pawns down after knight d7 there's a big threat now of rook b8 so bishop g7 is played white takes now just plays rook b4 just defending his a4 pawn so the knight's going to come back and here actually black just resigned he's two pawns down it doesn't seem for much so that was an interesting game against knight c6 the rosalimo system uh, let's have a quick review of this game then so Rosalimo system with bishop b5 so white doesn't mind giving up the light square bishop and just playing as though it's like a Roy Lopez just playing for d4 and it seems you know if you can get the bishop here from black with this bishop b2 it's going to be nasty for black oh um, Mustang fan sorry could you possibly engine check it I can't run an engine on here without using too many resources um, unfortunately uh, if someone could engine check that position later in this game that'd be really cool it's a very critical tactical moment but let's see so um, to get there so b4 clamping down on c5 oh, if you want the PGN ah, I'll just give you the PGN is okay so Queen b5 so the knight menacingly is threatening to come to a5 to really clamp down and put pressure on c6 so that's the kind of the exploitable weakness in black's position which leads to this pawn sack but white now has got this potentially dangerous outside a pawn on the cards so d5 a4 takes bishop a3 so this critical moment here a bit of a mystery knight g5 and apparently played queen e2 So if any of you know what the refutation is of taking the knight, please let me know. Um, or we'll come back to this in a bit. Someone's going to engine check this. But uh, black played rook f e8. So we have the knight being kicked. White really ends up just two pawns up. He's going to end up two clear pawns up very soon. Because knight and bishop and rook are really coordinating to get to the black king actually quite menacingly in this position so that's this desperate second pawn sack from black and here we just threw in the towel after rook b4 okay um well i hope you enjoyed this week there's a few adams games we went over um i'll be here for a minute or two oh and if we can get some analysis on that i'll show it in the next two or three minutes Otherwise, um, hope you enjoy the rest of the week and um, see you at the usual time next Tuesday. Uh, sorry about the rescheduling. I had a blitz tournament last night. I did all right. I beat an IM and I drew with a grandmaster, Garwin Jones. Garwin Jones? In one game, I was a bishop up, but I, I generously offered him a draw and he accepted. So that was last night. The North London five minute. That's why I couldn't like do the broadcast last night. So, but next Tuesday, back at the usual time. Um, okay. Thanks very much.